What's up everyone, Lukande Mwila here, back with another video, and we're talking K8s. A couple of videos back, I showed you how to create a Kubernetes cluster using RKE on your local machine, and that's usually where the journey starts. But where it ends is typically in a cloud environment, so I'm gonna show you how to spin up one in AWS using one command. Before I go any further, if you're only interested in seeing this in action, feel free to skip ahead in the video. How does this actually work? Keep in mind, everything that I'm about to say is completely automated using Terraform. And so I'm going to be provisioning a VPC in AWS that consists of public and private subnets. The public subnet will have a Bastion host. The Bastion host serves two purposes. One is that is where RKE is going to actually run and provision the Kubernetes cluster. And the second purpose is I'll be SSHing into it so that I can communicate with my Kubernetes cluster once it's been provisioned. So we're going to have what is known as a private cluster endpoint. It will not be publicly accessible. And now as for the private subnets, that is where my control plane and worker plane will exist. We're gonna have auto scaling groups for each of them, and that'll make it easy to set up a highly available Kubernetes cluster if that's what you desire, by simply specifying the, the number of desired and minimum size of nodes that you actually want. So that's more of the infrastructure side of things. The second part of this is, how does the Kubernetes cluster actually get provisioned? So if you recall, in the last video that I did, when we were talking about provisioning a cluster with RKE, the, the virtual machines were all making use of what is known as provisioning scripts. That works the same way in AWS using what is known as user data. So each of these nodes will have user data to essentially install all the relevant um, software that is needed and prepare the nodes in terms of configurations. And so one of the last steps that runs for the control plane and the worker plane nodes is that they will be able to access my cluster configuration file, which is stored in an S3 bucket. That cluster configuration file will have some code that will already be set in there for, based on the properties that I want, but a main thing that you need to make sure to have is there will be no data for the nodes. And so what's actually going to happen is as these nodes are provisioned, uh, they will access this cluster configuration file from the S3 bucket and they will populate that file. And I'm using a tool to update the YAML file. And once they're done updating that YAML file, it'll get uploaded back to the S3 bucket. And once the control plane and worker plane nodes are all ready and have run through all the relevant uh, script commands, the next thing will be the Bastion host will then download this cluster configuration file. In addition to that, it will have RKE installed. And um, the SSH key that is used to access the control plane nodes and the worker plane nodes will also be stored in an S3 bucket, which the Bastion host will have access to. And so that way, the Bastion host will then run the RKE up command specifying that cluster configuration file in order for it to actually provision the cluster with the specific nodes running in the private subnets. And it will be able to communicate with them because of the SSH key that I would have already created and will be stored in the S3 bucket. Once my Kubernetes cluster has been provisioned, you know, um, if you're familiar with RKE or have watched a previous video of mine, the kubeconfig file will automatically be generated. And once that file has been generated, the Bastion host will have a command for it to read that file and store that data in Secrets Manager. This is important because when you SSH into your Bastion host, that kubeconfig file will not be accessible to you. And so you'll need to pull that data from Secrets Manager localize it in kubeconfig when you when you sign in using the EC2 user and you can be able to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. So that might be a lot to take in, but again, it's great that all of this is automated for you. And I'm gonna do a detailed code walkthrough, but if you wanna jump ahead, feel free to do that. All right, in this section, I will be going over a few of the important files, but the main thing will be to demonstrate provisioning of the cluster. If you're wondering why I'm not doing a detailed deep dive, uh, well, one, I will do that in a separate video, and two is because my goal with this was to essentially fast track the process of provisioning an RKE cluster in an AWS environment for people that aren't too familiar with how to set up all of that underlying infrastructure and all the plumbing in an AWS environment and not sure how to do it in an automated way using infrastructure as code like Terraform. So this is essentially a gift, so to say, for people 
people um, that are in that kind of situation so that you don't have to be blocked or hindered. Um, you will have to go through the prerequisites such as making sure you have an, an AWS account um, and installing the necessary underlying software and these configuration initial configuration steps. Um, please note that this will only take you a few minutes before you can actually execute this. It's not going to take you too long. Uh, when you're generating your key pair, um, which will actually be used by the EC2 instances, uh, make sure to take note of that name because you will be supplying that name um, in the source code as well. And then it will, um, that is what RKE will essentially use to establish communication with the relevant nodes. It will be downloaded automatically um, from this, uh, from the console once you create it. Another thing to take note of is that the operating system I'm using for the EC2 instances is OpenSUSE Leap. If you have a free tier account, then this qualifies for that, so you won't be charged um, for using this operating system. If you're outside of your free tier, then you will have to pay the um, the relevant price. Now, bear in mind, all you have to do is come to this page and make sure you subscribe to it so that um, it's then associated with your particular AWS account, and then you won't run into any issues when provisioning um, your infrastructure. So that's very important. Uh, make sure you, you you generate your key pair and make sure you subscribe to make to using OpenSUSE Leap. Once your key pair has been created um, and you've downloaded that SSH key, you can then upload it to the S3 bucket that will also have your cluster configuration file. And we'll take a look at the cluster configuration file in a few minutes. Um, for starters, I want to show you the provisioning script for all of the worker nodes, um, the control plane, and the bastion host. And over here with the worker node is I'm installing um, YQ, as you can see over here, because that's the tool I'm going to be using to modify the cluster configuration file, which is a YAML file. And um, prior to that, I'm just installing a couple of um, utility tools that I'll be making use of. A very important one is I do want to have the AWS CLI tool. Okay. And um, of course, as you would imagine, because RKE runs Kubernetes in containers, um, I need to have Docker installed. Um, in addition to that, I'm disabling swap on the node. And then I make sure that there, a group is created for Docker and that I add the relevant user to that group. A lot of these additional configuration steps are similar to the ones that I was running even on my local virtual machine instances in a previous video. So I, I delve into those things a little bit deeper. Um, so you can check that out if you want to. What's really important over here is um, this last section. And so because the cluster configuration file is stored in an S3 bucket, when each node in the worker plane is being provisioned, it will download that cluster configuration file. And using the YQ tool, it will update the cluster configuration YAML file with the relevant details in the nodes section of the cluster.yaml file, specifying that it should have a role of worker, um, that we're going to be using the user, EC2 user, and um, I pull the host name from the EC2 metadata and I specify it in the address section for this particular node. Once I've done that, I upload it back, I upload the cluster configuration file back to the S3 bucket. So I'm doing something very similar with the with every node that gets created for the control plane. Um, the only difference over here, which is very important, is that every node in the control plane will should have these specific roles specified over here: control plane and etcd. Everything else is the same. The Bastion host is a little bit different. Um, as I mentioned when I was giving an overview, um, what's, your act what's actually taking place in the Bastion host is it will download the cluster configuration file as well as the SSH key that gets used to access those nodes. And um, I then download RKE and then provision my RKE cluster by running the RKE up command. And this should look familiar to you if, you're, if you've worked with RKE or have watched my previous videos. Once the cluster has been created, what I'm doing is I am reading the generated cube config file over here, as you can see, and I'm pushing that through to, I'm creating a secret and pushing those details through there um, so that they're available to me later when I SSH into my Bastion host. Lastly, um, I download and install kubectl so that I don't have to go through this process when I um, sign into my Bastion host. Now, uh, this cluster configuration file is uh, very similar to the one that I've used in uh, in previous videos. And all of these properties will essentially depend on what 
your specific requirements are and what you want to have um, in detail over here. What's important to remember is that the nodes property should be left empty because that will automatically be populated as each EC2 instance gets created. As for the SSH key path, this is also important because it will be downloaded from an S3 bucket locally onto the EC2 uh, instance um, that is serving the role as a Bastion host, and it will be in a local directory, so that is why I specify the path in this particular way and just make sure to replace this with the relevant name of your SSH key um, and then also give your cluster a name. Alrighty, so lastly, um, again, you don't have to worry too much if you're not very familiar with, Ter with Terraform. Um, the reason I want to show you this particular file over here, which consists of modules, which are groupings of all the different resources being created, is I want to show you how to uh, modify the number of nodes that you will have um, for your respective planes. For the control plane, if you do want to have a highly available cluster, then you would set your desired capacity to three and your minimum size to three as well. And that way it will make sure that you always have at least um, three control plane nodes running for high availability. If you're not really interested in that, feel free to update this over here to whatever your specific value is, but it would be less than three for high availability. As for the cluster worker uh, nodes, um, it will be something similar as well. You don't have to have three nodes provisioned. You can change this value to whatever um, your desired um, value may be. And so that's just a high level of this. Again, I will create a separate video delving into every nook and cranny that is contained in all the Terraform source code, but um, I'm hoping that this will unblock a number of people who don't necessarily deal with Terraform in their day-to-day -day and just want to provision a cluster. So the next step um, is to actually provision it. And so I'm going to head over to the specific directory, Infra Live. Um, I'm specifying dev over here um, because this is for what I'm calling my quote unquote dev environment. And then this app environment folder over here um, is where my TerraGrunt configuration file lives. And this TerraGrunt configuration file will point to the relevant modules. Don't worry too much about all those details. Um, this is the right folder for you to be in in order for you to provision this. And the next step would be to simply run TerraGrunt apply in this case, and I'm gonna run auto approve. So this is the one command that I've famously been um, going on about that you would have to run in this specific directory. Um, I should note that if you want to actually provision this cluster in different environments, you would simply create separate folders um, Apart from the dev one, you would create one for test, for example, and for prod, and um, change the, the a few details, just specifically the environment, um, and then go ahead and run this command, and it would work the exact same way. So I'm going to run that, and this is going to take me a couple of minutes for everything to be created. Now, in case you run into this issue, which you most likely will, um, you can simply run the same command. This is actually a bug in the provider plugin. And so you can just run that again and it will resolve the issue. As you can see, all of my infrastructure has been provisioned. Now, bear in mind, it will still take a couple of minutes um, for all of the user data to run all the relevant commands. And more than that, the provisioning of the cluster by RKE will take a little bit more time, so you'll still have to wait a little bit for that to happen. So I am in Secrets Manager, and you can, as you can see right at the bottom over here, the secret was successfully created, meaning that the entire process worked just like I wanted it to. And so here is my cube configuration details for my cluster. And so I have SSH'd into my Bastion host. And in case you want to actually go through the logs of that, you can simply run that command. And right at the bottom over here, you can see um, just like you would even with uh, when running this locally, the building of our Kubernetes cluster was successful. All those cube config details were then read from the local generated file and pushed through to the secret that was created. And as you can see over here as well, kubectl run uh, successfully and is installed rather. 
And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to create a local um, directory for my cube config because when the infrastructure is being provisioned, all those are running at a root level or rather using the root user. Um, and so now I'm using an EC2 user, so I do not have access to those cube config details. So what I'm gonna do, um, and I've specified this as well in the readme file is I'm just gonna go through the process of creating um, the directory for my cube config. Just pulling these commands from here. I'm gonna grab that. Now, very important to note over here is that my cube config uh, secret is RKE cube config 1991. So just make sure you have the relevant name over there. And so now I'm storing that in an environment var variable called cube config. And then I'm just going to create, I'm going to add that to a cube config file stored inside of the relevant directory that I just created. So I'm going to paste that. And there we go. So that means that now I should be able to communicate with my Kubernetes cluster. And I'm just going to run kubectl get nodes. And there we go, as you can see, three nodes for my control plane and three nodes for my worker plane, just as expected. So you can also check um, the pods that are running in all of the namespaces. Excellent, right, so um, the last important thing to do at this point is to actually deploy an application so we can see this bad boy in action. And so for that, I'm gonna go to my go to basic Node.js application, and I'm gonna clone that over here. Great, and once that is available to me, I'm gonna CD into that, and I will then run kubectl apply, and specify the manifest folder, which contains the manifests inside of there is a service um, manifest, as well as a pod manifest, um, so that will then create them as you can see over there. Express test, this is a basic Node.js application and it will be exposed using a load balancer which will be created in the AWS environment for me. So you can check that those are running as expected by running uh, kubectl get pods. And you can see over there and you can do the same with the service and so over there, you can see that is my external IP. So that is the load balancer that um, has been generated. And it'll take a couple of minutes for it to be in service. So you'll just have to wait a little bit. And as you can see, my application is working as expected and is publicly accessible because of the load balancer that has been created. So um, that is it. Our RKE Kubernetes cluster was created, uh, or rather has been created in an AWS environment, and it works as per norm um, with the caveat that this is using a private cluster endpoints. So any interaction with the Kubernetes cluster has to go through the Bastion host, which is a good and secure approach to restricting access to the API server. Thanks a lot for watching the video. I hope it was helpful. If you're interested in more content like this, do subscribe to the channel. You can always connect with me. Just check out the links below in the description. Remember that this entire project is available in the GitHub repository. So do clone that and feel free to make use of it. It is open source. And lastly, if you have a particular topic that you would like me to cover in the cloud native or Kubernetes specific space, leave it in the comments below. Till next time.